I want to try to share something with you for just a few moments this evening from the Word of the Lord and, um, and transition for just a moment and just try to edify you, try to lift you up. And, and I've only done this a, a couple of times. I, I've, and what I mean by that is I, I just preached this message last night in another church, but it was just to, all day today I just could not get it out of my, my spirit and out of my mind. And I prayed that if it wasn't God's will for me to preach this, that he would give me something else. And it was just one of those moments, one of those times when it was just silence from heaven. And um, just a simple thought I want to try to leave you with this evening. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to read from Joshua chapter 15. And uh, maybe it's, uh, for some of you, it might be somewhat of an obscure passage. Uh, but, but I pray that some way that uh, the word of the Lord would be a blessing to you this evening. And uh, maybe it would communicate something to us. But uh, Joshua 15, and uh, I'm going to be reading from the New King James translation. I hope that doesn't offend anyone here tonight. But uh, Joshua 15 and verse number 16 uh, says, And Caleb says, And Caleb said, He who attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it to him, I will give Aksha, my daughter, as wife. So Othanel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksha, his daughter, as wife. Now, it was so when she came to him that she persuaded him, her new husband, to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? And she answered, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. For just a few moments this evening, I want to talk to you about the blessing of the springs. The blessing of the springs. Let's take a moment and lift our hands and let's pray and ask the Lord's anointing and blessing upon the remainder here. Lord, we ask you for your anointing, for your presence. Uh, we already feel it here, but I pray that you would come and dwell among us for the remainder of this service, that you would bless and anoint your people and open up our hearts and our minds, our ears, that we may receive the word of the Lord with faith and gladness tonight. And I pray that you would anoint me, anoint these lips of clay to minister your word to your people tonight. And I pray that the word and the spirit of the Lord would enter into our souls, even to the dividing of the soul and spirit this evening. And that your light and your illumination would shine upon us and that you administer among us, bless and strengthen and encourage tonight. Let us lay hold upon the promises of the Lord tonight and that you administer freely among us, walk among us, speak to us, encourage us tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone say, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And as you're being seated, let's clap our hands unto the Lord one more time. tonight Jesus amen you probably for the most of you know the story of how uh, God used Moses to deliver Israel uh, out of the hand of Pharaoh and from the great army of the Egyptians and how that they had crossed that Red Sea after the Lord had parted the waters and uh, through their act of disobedience and of lack of faith they were uh, suffered to, they were uh, forced to wander around the wilderness for 40 years. And, uh, and then Moses brings them back to that river of Jordan. And there Moses, up on the mountaintop, passed away and, and was buried by the Lord up on the mountain. And, and Joshua, Joshua uh, assumed the leadership role of the nation of Israel. And it was Joshua who... Uh, got the priest to take up the ark, and as their feet touched the Jordan River, uh, twice in Joshua's lifetime, he saw the Lord part the waters. And the waters of Jordan, even though it was during the rainy season and the, and the time of flooding, the waters stopped and were parted. And uh, again, Israel crossed over on dry land and entered into that, uh, that great promised land that had been promised to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, you know how they first went to the uh, city of Jericho, and the walls came 
crashing down and they advanced on and conquered other cities and conquered the tribes and nations that uh, lived there. And, and we arrive to Joshua 15 and, and in this context, this passage, uh, the story takes place here uh, after the land of Canaan had been conquered and Joshua is in the process of dividing up the land among the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, apparently this town called Kirjath Sefer uh, must have been a very, uh, a very difficult place to conquer. No doubt it was a stronghold for whoever lived there in that city. It was such a difficult place to conquer and to overcome that Caleb offered a prize to whoever could conquer it, promising to give his daughter Aksha for a wife to anyone, to anyone that could take down the city of Kirjath Sefer. Uh, and this was not uncommon as we later see King Saul promising to give his daughter to the conqueror of Goliath. And so Othanel took the city of Kirjath Sefer and as Caleb had promised, he gave Othanel his daughter as wife. And uh, apparently Aksha went to her new husband and tried to persuade him. And I assume most of you husbands know what that means tried to persuade her new husband to ask her father for a piece of land. And, and we don't know what Othanel did. The story kind of switches gears there. But we know that when Aksha talked to her father again, that she acknowledged the fact that Caleb had given her some land in the south. And she says this when she dismounts off the donkey. She acknowledges that fact that her father had given her a piece of land in the south region there. And unlike us today, people in the Bible did not have a last name. However, many times they are identified by the land that they were from. Their land or their hometown was an important part of their identity. Amen. It was an important part of who they were. And to an extent we do this, uh, don't we? I mean, you're in Florida, you're in Tampa. I'm sure you get a lot of uh, visitors here from out of state, you know, people from overseas, free people from other countries, people from Minnesota and Canada trying to get a little sun, escaping the snow, retirees. Uh, they have their summer homes here. And if you begin to talk to someone in the supermarket and you notice their accent is a little bit different than what you normally hear, eventually you're going to ask them, where are you from, by the way? Because where we are from, our hometown, our homeland is an extension of who we are. It, was a, it is a part of our identity. In Genesis 14, Abram, who would later be called Abraham, he is the first person in the Bible who is called a Hebrew. And some scholars think that this is a reference to the fact that he was a descendant of a man named Eber. Others say that it means that the word Hebrew means one from beyond. And some scholars think that it means that it is a reference to Abram being from Ur, the city of the Chaldees, a city beyond the river Euphrates, because it meant that he was one from beyond. A couple of times the giant that David slew with a sling and a stone is called Goliath of Gath. There may have been other men named Goliath, but he was the only one from Gath. Uh, a, a, when we read about that wicked king Ahab and how he wanted and lusted after Naboth's piece of land, the Bible calls Naboth the Jezreelite because his vineyard was in a city called Jezreel. The location of his vineyard was as much of a part of his identity as was his first name. And when we jump over to the New Testament, the trend continues. Even our Messiah is identified by a piece of land, Jesus of Nazareth. And before he was Paul the Apostle, he was simply known as Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts. I mention this because many times people in the Bible were identified only by a piece of land or by the city that they were from. And so when Aksha went to her father, she told him, 
You've given me a piece of land. She acknowledged what her father had done for her. In other words, she is saying to her father, you have given me an identity, something that I can connect with. You have given me an inheritance, something that I can pass on to my children and to my children's children. And so it is when we come to our Heavenly Father, through the new birth experience, God gives us a new identity. John, reflecting on this in his first, in his first, uh, the first chapter of his uh, gospel, says he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Everyone say the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Maybe after having some time to reflect on what he had written in his gospel, John later wrote in his first letter, Behold, Think about it for a moment. Marvel at it. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Think about it for a moment. Marvel at it. Behold, stand in awe of it. What manner the love the, 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 love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And in, first, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things still linger. All things still we still carry around with us. All things are passed away. Behold, marvel. Think about it. All things are become new. I know that 99.9% that of you never have done anything wrong. You were always in church, always godly, always had a great prayer life, fasted three times a week, read your Bible for hours a day. Uh, you never wandered away from the cross. You never turned your back on the Lord. But for some of us, the other 0.01% of us, uh, when we came to the Lord, we did not have anything to offer Him but failures, problems, issues, broken promises, broken dreams, heartaches, sin, iniquity, perversion. We didn't have anything good to give Him. But in the midst, behold, what manner of of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Behold, marvel at it. All things, all those old things, all those things that I carried to the cross have passed away. Behold, I have a new identity in Christ. Some of us were known as the local drug dealer, the local drunk, the local prostitute, the local thief, the local liar. But when we come to Christ, we receive a new identity through the new birth experience. Paul, look, uh, Paul, the, the Apostle Peter, marveling at the existence of the church, wrote to them to encourage them, but, but you are a chosen generation. You didn't come into this thing by chance. Jesus on that last supper with his disciples said, hey, Bob, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I came looking for you. When everybody else had given up on you, when everybody else quit loving you, I came for you. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Wait, hold up. Peculiar doesn't mean strange, weird, or odd, but it means special. Come on, you are a special. Yeah. 
that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We become, through Jesus and the new birth experience, we take on a new identity. We become, as Paul said, more than conquerors through him that loved us. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should become more than conquerors through him. We become the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Ghost. And as John said, one day we will reign with him as kings and priests. I don't know about you this evening, but thank God for another chance on life. Thank God for another lease on life. Thank God for another opportunity. Some of you are hearing me. Come on, God can touch your body right now and just stop your heart. He could give me an aneurysm right now. But thank God. He's given me another chance. He's given me another day. He woke me up this morning. Thank God his mercy, his grace, his compassions, his long suffering abide with us. And so Aksha, she came to her father and she said, you know what? Thanks for the land, dad. I really appreciate it. Thank you for giving me an identity. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving me something I can pass on to my children. But more than a piece of land, more than just an identity, I want a blessing from you. Bless me and give me the upper and the lower springs. Listen to me for just a moment. Thank God for apostolic identity. Thank God that one day I had an understanding of the, uh, of the doctrine of the apostles. Thank God that it finally dawned on me and God gave me an understanding of the new birth and what it means to be born again of water and spirit. Thank God that one day while I was reading the Bible, he enlightened me at the entrance of thy word, there is light. And he gave me light and illumination. And I came to understand that our God is one Lord. Thank Thank God for an apostolic identity. Thank God for modesty and holiness and all those things that come along with the package of the apostolic doctrine. But lest I become content with being satisfied, with being identi identified with a movement, to becoming identified with Pentecostalism, becoming identified with some church on a corner. More than just being, having, maintaining an identity, I want God to bless me with the upper and the lower springs. It was during the Feast of Tabernacles when we get to John chapter 7. Uh, John says, I think it's in verse 2 of John chapter 7, that it was during the, the, feast of the, the week of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it, it was during the Feast of Tabernacles that a priest drew water out of the pool of Siloam. And in a golden vessel, he would bring it into the temple, to the temple. And at the time of the morning sacrifice, while those bloody members of the sacrifice were on the altar... He would go up to the altar and he would pour out this golden vessel of water that had been mingled with wine upon the altar. And it was, at, it was a very joyous occasion for the nation of Israel and those that were in attendance. As the priest would pour the water uh, upon the, that altar on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would sing the words of Isaiah 12 and 3. With joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. 
And then John later writes that it was at the time of the feast that John recorded in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, rivers of living water. And then John, in a parenthetical statement, explained, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus had not yet been glorified. I'm just saying this this evening. I don't want to be content with just an identity. I know what it's like to be in church for a few years. You know, uh, you can bring someone so messed up by life and by abuse and by addictions and, and problems and all kinds of stuff. But once they get born again of water and spirit and they get discipled, you know, after about, it takes, it, Bishop, it takes about two or three years, but then their life starts evening out. They start getting an understanding. And, and by about the fifth year, if you were to meet them in a church somewhere, you would have no idea what kind of life they used to live. But lest I get so content with just maintaining an identity. That I forget about the blessing of the springs. That I forget about the promise of the rivers of living water. The city that we live in, 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 in Cochabamba, Bolivia, it's about 8,500 feet above sea level. Mountainous, it's very, very dry, very arid, very dusty. And, and we actually have a, a rainy season and we actually have a dry season. During the winter months, our seasons are opposite of here in the States. And so the months of May, June, July are our winter months. And it is not uncommon for it to never rain during the winter months. There, weeks will go by and you won't even see a cloud in the sky. It is so dry and it becomes so arid. So dusty, you can sweep your house two or three, four times a day, and there's, there's just always that coat of dust on everything. But somewhere around the end of September, the first part of October, when the rainy season begins and the first rain comes, it's as if God has just been storing up truckloads of rain. Because that first rain, you will usually last about three or four days. And I'm not talking about a sprinkle. I'm not talking about a shower. I'm talking about a downpour. And if while it's raining, that, especially that first day, if you get outside, step out on the sidewalk, step out into the street, as the water is flowing down those hills, running down those uh, inclines on the street and the sidewalk and the gullies, all that water is just solid black. Because all that dirt, all of that filth, everything that has just been stored up, After about the third month of winter, all the rivers are dried up. Trash is accumulating, bottles and garbage and plastic bags. But when that rain starts, hey, I'm not against counseling. Thank God for wise and godly counsel. But, but, but maybe you don't need another counseling session. Maybe what you need to get the bitterness and the hatred and the pride and the arrogancy out is you need to tap into that springs of living water. You need to tap into the upper and the lower springs and let that river of the Holy Ghost wash out all of that carnality, wash out all of that lust, wash out all of that pride. Oh, 
you don't, you don't know. Hallelujah. Sister Josephine didn't shake my hand the other night. I may have to miss church for three or four weeks. No, no, no. You just need to tap into the river. As, as Israel... As Israel was traveling around, they were wandering around in the wilderness. Numbers 21 says this in verse 16, and, and from whence they went up to uh, Beer, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses. Mo God spake unto Moses, and he said, Gather the people together, and I will give them water. And the next verse says, Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. Spring up, O well. Hey, from time to time. Hey, listen to me for just a moment. I go to enough churches, and some of them are so, I know it's my preaching when I'm at those churches. It's so dry and dead. You can't even get a hand clap or amen. I know it's because of me. Hey, but from time to time, you got to come into the house of the Lord. I know how life is. You get so distracted, and your mind is here and there, and you're worrying about problems at work, and you're worrying about marital problems and child-rearing problems, and if you're going to have enough money at the end of the month, sometimes you just need to get into the house of God and say, Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. You know the story of how Elijah, he goes, he squares off against those 850 prophets of Baal and whichever God answers by fire, he is the Lord. And you understand they were in the middle of a drought that had been going on for three and a half years. And all those false prophets were cutting themselves and doing all this dancing and all their rituals and, and nothing happened. And, and uh, Elijah prays a little, uh, a little prayer. Boom! Fire falls, consumes everything. And the people begin shouting. Come on, listen to me. They begin shouting, the Lord, he is God. 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 And Elijah looked at them as they were shouting in the dust. And he's probably thinking, thank God for revelation. But right now, it's just dry doctrine. It's just dry doctrine right now. But wait a minute. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Thank God for apostolic doctrine. But every once in a while, you need an inundation of rain. The sons of Kor were been writing Psalm 46. The sons of Kor were writing for Psalm 46, and they write in verse 4. Put that up there. Can you put that up there real quick? Psalms 46 and 4. There is a. There is a. There is a. The streams whereof shall make sad. Shall make glad. The city of God. Wait a minute, what's the city of God? I don't know, I just kind of take it as the dwelling place. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad. You might not have any joy, maybe because you haven't tapped into the river. shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the town. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to tap into the river. 
Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. I don't want to lose my apostolic identity, but at the same time, I want to be like Aksha, Father. Thank you for the inheritance that you have given me, but bless me. I don't want to forget about the upper and the lower springs. Thank God for the lower springs, that which I've already passed. But I don't want to forget about the upper springs that are coming. Bless me with the upper and the lower spring. Can I say it this way? Bless me with the former and the latter rain together. You know the story of Jacob. He sent all of his family over the river of Jabbok. And the Bible says he was there. He was left alone. And sometime in the night... The angel of the Lord came, and I don't know what all happened, but they got into a wrestling match. And as the dawn began to break, and the sun began to reach his fingers over the land, the angel of the Lord told Jacob, let me go, let me go. And Jacob says, no, there's no way I'm loosening my grip until you bless me. Some of us need that kind of determination like Jacob. I'm not letting go of you, Father. Thank you for the apostolic identity, but I want a blessing. Let's stand this evening. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. As, as John is getting to close out the final revelation of Jesus Christ, he records these words in the last chapter of the Bible. And he says in verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life. For, listen to me for just a moment. Can you, can you put that verse up there? Revelation 22 and 17, there it is. Look, look, at, what he's, look at what he's saying. And, and the Spirit... And the bride, that's the church, say, come. It is a general invitation to everyone here. He's saying, come. But then he narrows it down. And let him that heareth. Because not everyone that's been here tonight has been listening to me. Let him hear it, that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst. Because not everybody that's here is thirsty. I'm telling you. I, I know what life is like. I know what it's like to get up at eight in the to be at your job at eight in the morning, work till four thirty, go to your second job and be there by five, and work till one in the morning and get home at two and do it all over again the next day. I know what it's like to drag into church on a Wednesday night at eight fifteen just so you can try to get something. 
And I know what it's like when you get out in the, and you get out and you're working outside and you're doing whatever you do outside, construction work, garden work, whatever you do outside. Or you get around the office and you do whatever you do in the office and you're working and you get busy and you're teaching Bible studies, you're doing working for the Lord, you're doing whatever. And all of a sudden it's like you get a self-revelation. Man, I'm thirsty. And you can parallel that over to the spirit world. You get so busy with life, running here, doing this, running errands, take care of this, worrying about that, working for the Lord, doing good things into church, feeding the poor, helping out people, doing this, going here, taking people here and there. And you get to church on a Wednesday night and the preacher's preaching and all of a sudden you realize, I'm thirsty. thirsty I know this message ain't for everybody the musicians can come I don't I don't know how y'all normally do things on Wednesday night but this one thing I do know there's a difference in being satisfied with an identity being satisfied with a movement being satisfied with being identified with a church. There's a difference in that, in being thirsty for a genuine move of the Holy Ghost to the extent that it's not a well, it's not a stream, but it becomes a river. When was the last time you left church knowing that the Holy Ghost, that the streams thereof have made you glad? After Abraham had passed away, Abraham had spent his time doing two things, building altars and digging wells. And after Abraham passed away, the Bible says that his, own, that his son, Isaac, that the Ishmaelites had, had went around stopping up those wells that Abraham had dug, throwing sand and whatever kind of trash in them, stopping up those wells. And Isaac went back to those areas, and the Bible says he dug again. He opened up those well springs of water that had once freely given. So it is in life. Sometimes things just come into our lives that try to stop up the well. And tonight you got two choices. You can be content with that. Or you can do what Israel did. Spring up a well. Church, I don't want to be content with just to be just just to be content with an identity. I don't want to be Pentecostal and apostolic in name only. Come on, can I, can I ask something to say? When was, when was the last time you, you worshipped until you really started worshipping? When was the last time you started dancing until you really started dancing? When was the last time you spoke in tongues until you really started speaking in tongues? When was the last time you was at the altar and got under the power of God till everybody thought, man, he's drunk in the Holy Ghost? <laughs> to those that are thirsty. Some of you need to be militant about it. Bless me, Father. Bless me, Father. Hey, I'm not letting go tonight until you bless me. 
I didn't come for another dry, dusty service. I'm not here to hear just some more dry doctrine, but I want an abundance of rain. I want to tap into the well springs of the living water that Jesus Christ had promised me. Come on, I'm thirsty tonight. With joy, I want to draw water out of the well of salvation. Come on, let's let the Holy Ghost minister tonight. Let's let the Holy Ghost do a work among us tonight. Let's let the Holy Ghost wash out all that filth and all that carnality and all of that sin out of us tonight. There is a river whose streams thereof make glad. Let's get glad tonight.